It's been 35 years since the October crash of 1987. Black Monday saw equity markets around the world suddenly plunge, wiping out an estimated $1.7 trillion. The causes are still debated, but a long overextended bull market was the setup, and the response of policymakers afterwards dictated how countries were able to rebound. For David Rosenberg, that fatal day also marked his first day working as an economist in an investment bank. Talk about baptism by fire. I caught up with David to talk about the experience and whether there are any parallels to today. Hi, David. How are you? Well, uh, no matter how I'm doing, let's just say that uh, a heck of a lot better than Mr. Dow and Mrs. Jones. How about that? (laughs) Yeah. I set the bar. I set the bar really low. (laughs) And the poor suffering investors who were who were hanging on to. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dow and S and P and a lot of other stuff that's underwater. So um, it's 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 very timely. We're taping this as we approach the 35th anniversary of the 1987 crash. Mm. So I think we thought it would be a, a really good time to sort of look back at that and then talk about whether there are any parallels. And incredibly, that crash was the start of your career. Uh, as an economist, as a market watcher. So sort of take us back um, to that time. Was was that actually your first day at work? It was my first day as a street economist uh, at the Bank of Nova Scotia, uh, October 1987. Uh, So I embarked on my career in this industry on the day of a 23% collapse in the stock market. So, you know, as I will tell you and tell everybody else, you know, if that happened to you, uh, you'd be Eeyore the donkey for the rest of your professional life as well, which is, they call me the perma bear. I said, well, it's, it's almost like genetic in some way, because that was my first day. And let me tell you something. Yeah, it was, it was frightening. Uh, I had actually been working three years prior at uh, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation in Ottawa, which is sort of like Fannie Mae. Uh, And I was a public servant uh, housing economist and a nice cushy job uh, working for the government. And it was my first day actually uh, at a financial institution. My first day that I stepped onto a trading floor, uh, there were people, you know, swinging from the, uh, from the chandeliers. It was, it was actually, it was mayhem. And and it was, it was actually, it was, it was a frightening experience. Great day to start. I learned a great deal from that day. Uh, I'll never forget it. Um, but, um, (laughs) yeah, terrifying. I I can imagine. It was, it was, it was terrifying. Absolutely. So did the day start out normally? No, it didn't start out normally. Nothing was really normal. Um, you know, the, the market peaked, uh, at the end of August, Alan Greenspan had come in and like most central bankers that come in, uh, they like to flex their muscles and he raised rates aggressively. Uh, and, uh, it was really a, negative liquidity cycle it all happened very quickly but you know if you remember before they called it black monday uh the friday before was no picnic and it was called black friday so friday Mm -hmm. the market plunged and then it like basically the trap door opened up on monday but you could see the pressures um i mean back then i don't think we had bloomberg screens but we had reuters and um you know it was a bit more (laughs) archaic there was no internet um, but you could see that um, things are going haywire in the futures market, on the currency market. And uh, you could see that we were going to open up the day uh, down a lot. But who knew that we're going to be down, um, you know, 23%. Uh, I think it was uh, Alan Greenspan famously said, I think he was like in an airplane. Um, and he was just landing and someone said, oh, the, the market's down uh, 2 3 And he says, oh, he thought 2.3. No, no, 23%. Um, yeah, you, you had this feeling that, um, you know, the whole financial system, uh, was going to implode, you know, I mean, we've had, look, since that time, we've had other feelings, uh, you know, we, we had the, the dot coms, we had long-term capital, long-term capital, if it didn't get unwound by the New York fed, that, that also would have been an unmitigated disaster. Then of course we had the financial collapse. Look, if, if TARP doesn't get passed and, um, you know, Timothy Geithner doesn't, uh, you know, corral all the bank CEOs in a room and say, we're going to stuff this capital down your throat, whether you like it or not. I mean, there was palpable fear even back then, back in March of 09, uh, as to whether or not the banks were 
U.S. banks are going to be nationalized. So, yeah, uh, you know, we're I was, but I was I was born into uh, to a crisis um, that was basically a full fledged bear market lumped into one day. But going into that, the market had already peaked. The market was already down almost ten percent. Doesn't seem like a lot right now. <laughs> yeah, well, now I was I was going to say but, I think it's important to remember that you know we we with the advent of technology and when we're talking about big moves, I mean, if you just see what happens, I mean, now the thought of the NASDAQ being down, I think it was down three or 4% just before we came on air. Um, so if bigger moves, we're, we're used to them now, but back then mm. to see that market drop 23%, I mean, had anyone ever seen that happen in one day? No, no. Uh, I mean, uh, unless you were around in uh, you know October 1929, uh, you, you didn't see a a day like that. I, I mean, and, and so there was a um, uh, there was there was there was panic, and, and of course Greenspan came in. The Fed just flooded the system with liquidity. Uh, the ultimate lows didn't happen for a few weeks later, but uh, there was calm. Why was it so severe? Why so? What, for, for let, actually take us back what mm. why what sparked it so it the the crack started to show on friday but why what was going on was there the a blow up Green, in a firm no well well you know it, it uh greenspan was raising rates aggressively draining liquidity you had a lot of leverage in the system uh and then what you had was over a span of a few days you just had one one series of margin calls after another mm. that's where you got to appreciate um, how these downward spirals can feed on themselves. Uh, and so what happens with margin calls is you have to then, you know, sell sell, sell your collateral. Uh, you have to raise money and you have to sell your assets and it becomes a, really a, a, a downward feeding event on itself. Um, and so, but there was nothing fundamental about it. I mean, the uh, it's almost uh, incredible to think that, you know, in, in a quarter where real GDP growth was over 5%, we were at full employment. Uh, the economy, you know, back then was when you think about it, we were five years into uh, the Reagan revolution. And, uh, uh, you know, it was just basically a massive liquidity event. Uh, but the Fed was draining liquidity, raising rates aggressively, flattening the yield curve. It wasn't inverted. Um, and so that goes to show you that at any given moment of time, when you're doing your your analysis of the stock market, You've got to pay attention to so many things. It's not always about the fundamentals. Uh, it's mm. also about liquidity. Uh, I mean, you go back to that horrible period around long-term capital, the U.S. economy was growing 4%. If I told you everything was happening with the labor market and the economy back in the summer and fall of 1998, as another example, you'd never have thought that the stock market in a matter of just basically, you know, barely more than a month was going to be down uh, almost 20%. Uh, and so the same thing in 87, the 20% <laughs> got lumped in pretty well one day. Uh, the economy was doing really was fabulously well. But you have to take a look at the technical picture, the fund flows. Uh, you have to take a look at liquidity um, and uh, and all, all these things uh, alongside the fundamentals when you're doing your equity market analysis. And so what happened back then was everybody was naked long on leverage uh, and the Fed was taking the punch bowl away. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, you have the margin calls, uh, a lack of uh, liquidity, uh, financial market dislocation. There was financial market dislocation, and it was in the equity market. The Fed steps in. It's, it's in is it much different than, say, I would say that uh, the UK in its bond market had an October 19th event just a few weeks ago. And so the central bank steps in, and uh, and that's its job, really, is to... to uh, when things get disorderly by two or three standard deviation events, the central bank, as quotes the lender of last resort, has to step in. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, these things tend to happen in tightening cycles. Uh, and when central banks are draining liquidity, and especially coming into a situation, as we saw, where there's a tremendous amount of leverage created by the previous bull market and the previous radical easing by these central banks. And, and that's why they're called cycles. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, it, you know, I appreciate the the intro in terms of October nineteenth, eighty seven. Let me tell you something, okay? It's never it's never left me. Uh, I think I, yeah. I think about it all the time. How so? Oh, just a reminder uh, of um, of how fragile uh, the financial markets can be, and also how radical shifts in 
asset prices in both directions can elicit uh, such a fundamental change in behavior, uh, and quite often unnecessarily so. You know, when I was at the Bank of Nova Scotia, people thought we're going to go into a depression because uh, of what happened. Mm. And I remember it well because um, I was I just got hired in the economics department at the Bank of Nova Scotia, and the powers to be at the bank um, slashed the research budget by half. Uh, half of my department, I just started there. Uh, got let go uh, in the following month uh, because everybody was cutting costs, thinking that we were going to have a economic depression that followed this financial market calamity. And I think at the same time, it, it, it taught you, it, it's taught you that liquidity. Everybody always talks about, don't worry, the labor market's so great, the economy's hanging in. Not, okay, that's great. There's probably five things that should go into your decision as to what you should do with your portfolio. The fundamentals, great. Liquidity, liquidity is the oxygen tank for the financial markets. And uh, that's usually embedded. Of course, you see it when it's too late in bid ask prices. But that's why I always said that the yield curve, if you don't believe the yield curve is a good indicator for economic turning points, it certainly is a great indicator for liquidity conditions, broadly speaking, for the financial markets. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture, and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. And it's funny because liquidity isn't something that is as easy to measure for the average person who's trying to make decisions. You know, how can you, wh what can you look at to see what the situation is with liquidity? Well, I think that you'll always see it uh, in, in, like I said, in, in bid ask spreads, uh, you know, that's, that's where, that's where you'll see it. Uh, I mean, once the bids start to disappear, uh, once actually it's, it's difficult uh, for participants to make markets, uh, then, you know, you're in a liquidity crunch. But you mm -hmm. want to avoid it. Uh, and so how you avoid it is you look at the leading indicators that tell you that liquidity conditions, in other words, liquidity, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is hard to describe because it's not something you can see, touch or feel when you talk about liquidity. And yes, people to talk about will define liquidity to me. Uh, the money supply doesn't usually contract. People say, mm -hmm. well, you know, uh, I mean, even in periods where we had liquidity dry up as far as the markets are concerned, the money supply, broadly speaking, uh, wasn't uh, contracting. So it comes down to a confidence, confidence in your counterparty. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also comes down to uh, confidence, generally speaking, in the financial markets. And so when I take a look at the yield curve, I and mean, it's people always said to me, if you had to be in a desert island, and a lot of people wish I was, uh, I always said that, and it's so maligned. You know, what's interesting. You know, what's interesting is that when the central banks cut rates, it's always, you know, don't fight the Fed when they're cutting rates. Don't, you don't hear anybody say that anymore. Uh, but when they're cutting rates, they're steepening the yield curve. Nobody ever debates the veracity of the yield curve and basically telling you what is going to be happening with liquidity conditions, the economy. And it's basically green light for the risk on trade. Uh, when the Fed is cutting short rates, the yield curve is steepening, is benevolent, and it tells you that liquidity in terms of confidence in markets is going to be uh, improving, as if we didn't see that big time back in the winter and spring of 2009. Next thing you mm -hmm. know, Ben Bernanke is talking about green shoots. Mm -hmm. The market was already well on its way towards a fundamental bull market. And so that's why the yield curve is so important. And when it inverts, it's telling you that uh, liquidity is going to be a problem. And liquidity is a problem. Liquidity has been a problem in the bond market. You just saw what happened in the UK. Let, let's mm -hmm. see what other skeletons globally are in the closet. Um, but it tells you something about uh, fear over greed when the yield curve inverts. And really liquidity comes down to that fear factor. It comes down to confidence. Uh, and uh, the banks in that environment tend to pull back uh, on their credit lines. It creates a credit crunch, which I think we'll be heading into in the next year. Uh, and that's uh, all the things that follow. The major point about October 1987 was that it wasn't an economic event. What we have going on right now is actually a liquidity event and an economic event. That's different. We didn't have a recession uh, on October 1987. If you remember, the recession came about three years later. 
Uh, and so we didn't have a recession in uh, late summer, fall of 1998 around long-term capital liquidity event. Uh, the fundamental recessionary bear markets are different. Uh, those were really very scary periods. In retrospect, we know that they were liquidity spasms uh, that once the central banks responded uh, by steepening the yield curve, uh, that then we were able to put that behind us and move on. That is not what we have in our hands today. So l- let me ask you a question. I think that's an incredibly important point to talk about. So 87 was a liquidity crash, not an economic fundamental problem. What about the others we've seen? The dot-com bust, mm. economic problem? or <clears throat> dot, Yeah, well, we, we <laughs> excuse me. We had, a, um, we, had an, we had a recession. And when you have a recession, you have uh, the multiple contracting alongside the earnings recession, which is why, <coughs> excuse me, a very strong T. Um, in a, in a recession, in these, in these, in these days. <laughs> yeah, strong T was something else added to it just uh, for good measure. So um, but we, 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 we won't go there, but in these types of markets, it certainly helps. Uh, there's a f- big difference between a liquidity-induced correction. Look, we had, we had one, for example, with Powell back in late 2018. Mm -hmm. Uh, December 2018 was no walk through the park. I mean, we were down almost 20% uh, in the S&P 500. Uh, But the economy didn't slip in a recession. And of course, then we had the Powell pivot. We didn't have a recession, a very intense drawdown. Uh, You could say we had the same sort of thing happening back in 2016. We had the lead up to Brexit. And alongside that, um, you know, the concerns over competitive devaluations and capital outflows in China. 2016 was a rough year. Um, you can go back to, oh, well, we, Alan Greenspan, once again, we can go back to uh, 1994. They doubled the funds rate, didn't invert the yield curve. We had a slowdown, didn't have a recession. Of course, we took out Orange County in Mexico and a couple of mortgage funds along the way. But you see, uh, those are liquidity-induced corrections, uh, not fun to participate in, um, but they traditionally will lead to a decline in the market of 10 to 20%. And then we move on. Um, you see, this is different. We have in our hands today. Uh, the dot coms were the same. The dot coms are basically an economic recession. Where what happens in an economic recession, much like we're seeing now, uh, much like we saw in classic form from '07 to '09, is you get the contraction in the market multiple uh, because of the interest rate reset, and then you get the double whammy from the recession's impact on corporate earnings. And that's why if you're taking a look historically, and, you know, we always talk about peak to trough declines, peak to trough declines. We're talking a lot about that the S&P 500 is down 25% year to date. Not the right way to look at it, uh, because as they say, the harder, the higher they go, the the harder they fall. You can't look at 25% down this year without looking out of the context that in less than two years, the market more than doubled. So it's always about how much of the previous bull market condition do you reverse in the bear market. It's about reversals. Mm. Uh, It's not about percent decline. Okay. If that's all you did was percent decline with the NASDAQ back in the early 2000s, 2000s, you missed out on a lot. It's about the reversal. In a liquidity induced correction, about 40% of the previous bull market gets unwound. And by the way, that was just as much true because don't forget that the awful October 1987 happened after a huge five-year bull market in equities off the August 82 lows. You have to take a look at how much are you reversing, okay? How parabolic was the move before this bear market? You can't just say, oh, we're in a bear market. Uh, Historically, we're down 25%. We're down 25%. Go by the market. No, no, no. What is the reversal from the previous bull market condition? So if if it is not a recession and it's just a liquidity event, um, like, for example, the fourth quarter of 2018, you reverse 40% historically of the previous bull market condition. When it's a recessionary bear market, totally different set of circumstances. In a recessionary bear market, 83.5%, just to be precise, 83.5% of the previous bull market condition gets reversed. That's why I was saying all along, if you, well, I was saying it actually up until, you know, the summer when we had that nice, you know, two month rally off the lows, I said, look, 
if you believe this is going to be a soft landing, and a lot of people do, and this is just basically a liquidity event, uh, the, the Fed's tightening policy, um, nothing else to worry about as far as the economy is concerned. Um, and we're talking about in that scenario, if you believe that, and you believe that therefore 40% of the previous bull market gets reversed, well, guess what? 3660 was the low. And I said, if you believe that, the lows have been turned in. It's not that's not what I believe, but if that's what you believe, you want to buy the market. Great. Uh, but I was saying that basically, if this is a recessionary bear market, which I continue to believe it is, and we look at historically what gets reversed from the previous bull market condition, which you always have to look at, you know, to know where you're going, you've got to know where you've been. Mm. Uh, then you're looking at something that is more like 2,700 on the S&P. It's not 3,600 and change. And I think that's where we're heading. Do uh, recessionary bear markets always create liquidity problems? Uh, generally, you get liquidity problems along the way because it's all part and parcel of the fact that the, the Fed has drained liquidity so much that it's now impairing economic activity. David, I want to ask you, so you've you've seen this, right? From the first day you walked onto the floor in 87, you've seen all of the crashes. Um, they The Fed is telling us that they want inflation down. They're telling us that they're willing to push us into recession to get there and that oh. they're willing to see the equity market go down. Mm. Do they think they can do this without causing a liquidity problem? Well, is that what they're, they're inherently they're, well, they're betting not, on? Well, though, to me, it's a natural outcome. I, I said before, recession or not, we've never gone through a Fed rate, rate hiking cycle without some sort of accident happening along the way. Uh, and, um, whether or not you get a recession, a recession just makes matters worse because you get a default cycle on top of that. Uh, inevitably, they're going to cut rates. Uh, it might right, not so be they're going to pivot anyway. Well, the it, question yeah, is, gonna... do they do enough damage to get there yeah. that they 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 screw us for two years, basically? Well, that's the cycle. But I mean, the thing is that, well, okay, with, they... with, with, look, with all deference, he compares himself to Paul Volcker. You know, what What more do you want? And of course, back then we had an emerging market crisis. And so maybe you're looking at emerging markets right now and you're looking the busiest people on earth outside of the Bank of England is the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, and of course, part of this is also, you know, you can look at cracks everywhere. The U.S. dollar has only gone up this much this past year, only five other times back in the past 50 years. And we, we came off so much leverage. Like I said, you know, this is like, the, the 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 Fed was Lucy. The rest of us were Charlie Brown. They they sucked us in. You see, this is where it becomes a very disingenuous that here you had the Fed. You know, they I mean they opened up the kimono and were, were allowing. You know, they were buying the capital structure of zombie companies, right? And then they're buying mortgages into the opening months of this year in the context of we all know it was actually a bigger price bubble in residential real estate than it was back when I was pounding my fist on the table at Merrill back in the mid two thousands. The Fed's doing all this. They knew. People were saying FOMO. They knew people were saying Tina. They knew people were saying the Fed has your back at all times. They knew that. Yeah, the Fed has your back. The Fed has your back again today, but they have a knife in it and they're, and they're twisting it hard. It's it's really quite, I, I'd say, almost cruel that at no point did they use their verbal guidance mm. to get people to, you know, even, even Greenspan tried that. Of course, didn't work out so well for him. Uh, in December of 96, when he talked about irrational exuberance. But you see, the Fed... Look, the Fed wants the Fed wanted the stock market. The Fed wanted to reflate asset prices for a while. And then we got two more than we bargained for. They wanted to reflate, 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 reflate. And then basically they just like a clown at the circus, blew the balloon, blew the balloon. And now the balloon is, you know, I'm not saying it's bursting, but so there's certainly helium coming out now of the real estate market. And you're saying basically, look, it's been a horrible, horrible year, both for, you know, pre pretty well for virtually every asset class. And so, so the Fed, but the it, Fed, the, the, but is that's it what different the Fed, now? Is it different well, from '87 in that we're, we haven't seen this absolute puke one day disaster? Or in the case of 2000, you know, 2008, 2009, great financial crisis. It was a week where we felt like we're in free fall and we did so much damage. This has been kind of this really painful decline all year, and you've seen big losses in some places. Is it orderly enough this time around to avoid? falling into the crash history books or are we just we're just going there it just depends on where it happens well i i think that if we get a situation and the bank of england that that's the boilerplate look if we get in a situation where markets become dislocated um 
and um, uh, you get some sort of calamity, uh, the central bank has to step in at all times as the lender of last resort. Uh, and so, yeah, the Fed's not going to sit back and allow, you know, they're not going to allow a, a Great Depression to unfold. And so, of course, they'll step in. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. Um, spreads have widened. Um, the stock market's in a bear market. Uh, Treasuries have been in the bear market. Mortgages are in a bear market. I mean, pretty well everything. Commodities are now in a bear market. Uh, and you're right. It's been, it's always orderly until it becomes disorderly. And uh, we can pick maybe five or six different things. I don't know, in the next year. The point I'm making is that, yeah, it's been orderly so far. They want the stock market to go down. I mean, how could you dispute that? Anybody can dispute that. Neil Kashkari comes on a couple of months ago and says that we were at the Fed. We were very disappointed uh, at the stock market rallying mm -hmm. in the summer because uh, Jay Powell utters the words data dependency. No, we we were disappointed that the markets rallied. And then, of course, after Jackson Hole, when the markets reverse course, he says, we're very actually happy with this response. They want the stock market to go down. They want home prices to go down. Why? Because there's not a snowball's chance in hell they're going to get to their 2% holy grail consumer inflation without there being a period now of asset deflation. It is 100% necessary. The recession, in their view, the aggregate supply curve is sclerotic. Uh, they're not paying attention to the supply curve. We have never seen the Fed tighten policy into such a bear market. I mean, the CRB raw industrials are down 20%. Who has ever tightened policy. I don't think Volcker tightened policy into a bear market in commodities to this extent. They don't care. Uh, and so, uh, and they're telling us in their forecasts that we're going to have a recession. Uh, so does this feel like it's going to be, you know, if we get some sort of event that feels more like, you know, 87 or, you know, that we get that capitulation that everyone talks about where everyone's just because of margin calls, having to sell everything. We've kind of been programmed that from liquidity driven events, things bounce back. Do we need to have, do we need to layer on those other factors you talk about and prepare ourselves for the fact that once it goes down and the Fed achieves the recession and achieves the stock market? decline, that it could stay there for a while because of the damage that's been inflicted? Which, which sort of camp do you fall into? Well, look, I think every cycle is different, but, you know, there's, you know, patterns that reemerge. We did get hit with a uh, several uh, supply side shocks. Uh, I would have thought by now that they would have subsided. Uh, I didn't think that core, the core inflation rate was going to be heading up towards 7%. I'm, I'm astounded. Uh, that that's happening. Um, and uh, then again, when you're taking a look at some of the sectors that are responsible for the inflation, uh, it's been rents, uh, OER and rents, that's 30% of the index, medical care services, education. Um, I don't know what the Fed can do about, uh, about education services, which are accelerating. That was a, a huge part of the uh, CPI uh, you have the rents, which are not going to subside till post first quarter, given the lags and how the index is uh, constructed in the CPI. I think the Fed is overreacting, but um, they, uh, as I said before, their principal concern came out of the minutes is that uh, if they don't move really aggressively, that uh, th that this gonna it's going to feed into wages. That's what their principal concern is. As a central banker, how do you get around that? Is you have to create the conditions for labor market slack to reemerge, which means a rising unemployment rate. Uh, what the stock market does, the stock market does. Of course, they don't mind. They, I mean, they, the asset deflation will actually hasten the day that we get to the 2% holy grail. They, they, they're not gonna, we're not going to get a 2% okay, uh, inflation with the stock market going up to record highs and, and home prices have to come down as well. And that's, that's part and parcel. Home prices have to come down for the rents to follow with a lag to get to the 2%. It all falls out of like basically asset deflation. Well, it's the asset deflation that can create the conditions for a some sort of financial spasm, okay? Because what happens is that the bank's collateral, uh, you know, the big, their biggest asset is mortgages on their balance sheets. What happens if you go into a default cycle? Home prices go down. Uh, the banks are already starting to tighten their credit scoring. So you get a not only a run-up in the cost of capital, but you also get a diminishment in the availability of capital. 
Um, and that's what triggers the onset of, um, of, a, of, a, of a default wave, which we haven't seen yet. To me, that probably is next year's story. You remember that, um, you know, the Fed was tightening when the Fed was tightening in 1999 into the mid part of 2000. All the bad stuff didn't happen uh, until 2001. Uh, the Fed was tightening all the way from mid-2004 to mid-2006. All the bad stuff didn't really start to happen until 07, 08. Mm -hmm. All this stuff happens with a lag. Uh, what the Fed does, because as because not everything is reset, you know, what happened in the first half of the year in terms of the economy being so weak, no matter what metric you really look, look at, outside the labor market, which is a lagging indicator, but all the real-time economic indicators, it was a pretty weak year. I mean, we went into this year, you look at the Fed's forecast at the end of 2021, we we're supposed to have 4% real growth this year. Now, all of a sudden, we're at zero. So people talk about, well, the Fed missed the boat on inflation. Well, they were talking about 4% real growth for this year. You know, Now we're down to zero. And we haven't seen all the lags. That's the thing is that the first half of this year, this year has really been about how inflation, especially food and fuels, which is a de facto tax, how that undermined and impaired real spending power in the economy, especially mm -hmm. in the household sector. We They only started to raise rates in March. And then the yield curve only inverted in April. And all these things basically cascade with lags that are between six and 18 months. Like basically we ain't seen nothing yet. And as far as the stock market's concerned, all we've had is we've had the multiple go from 21.22 to 16. We've just basically mean reverted to the long run mean. We haven't even seen the earnings recession yet. That's ahead of us. That impairs corporate cash flows. We're going to get rising unemployment. The Fed's told you already we're going to 4.4. The question is, what is the Fed funds rate that's going to get us to 4.4? Okay. We're going up. It means job loss. What's that going to do to... Uh, consumer cash flows. Uh, what is that going to do to consumer defaults? Uh, this is all next year's story. Yes. So next year is going to be the year where we get the financial spasms. Next year will be the year where the Fed, as it always does, will scream uncle and say, we are done. And there has never been a Fed tightening cycle that lasted forever. There's every Fed tightening cycle was followed by a pause. And then four to six months later, we are followed by a pivot. If you wanted to find a pivot, it's not a pause, but actual rate cuts. I don't know why people don't have, they have a problem with that story. They think the Fed will never cut rates again. Give me a break. You know, we call Jay Powell, we, we call Paul Volcker the greatest inflation dragon slayer of all time. Well, because he was. He was also the greatest interest rate cutter of all time. I mean, he cut the funds rate 1,200 basis points. Uh, and so we will go through, I think, starting the second half of next year, I expect actually that they'll go, they'll, at this point, go, they'll go 75, then they'll go 75. Th then they're probably going to be done because I think by the opening months of next year, uh, things in the economy are going to look a lot worse. And I think that we're going to go through another big leg down in, in equities. And of course, they pay attention to it. Uh, and uh, home prices going down to me is a very big deal. Uh, look, they're front loading for a reason. They've been moving aggressively. This is very unusual. This is actually... I think even if you go back to the Volcker years, I think this is the biggest increase in the Fed funds rate in a short time period. And don't forget at the same time, they're shrinking their balance sheet. That's the other thing. The other, you know, the other elephant in the room is the balance sheet. So even when we talk about pivot, pause, pivot, cut, they're still shrinking the balance sheet. And the balance sheet reduction at an annual rate is worth more than 200 basis points of a de facto increase in the funds rate. When are they going <laughs> to, and they haven't even started selling MBS yet. Uh, so, um, it's a uh, complicated situation. I think that uh, I, I think that we could be done the tightening cycle by the end of the year. Okay, and I think that the lags the story for next year. It's like what was the story in 2022? What was the story in 2008? What was the story in 1991? The lags. The lags. The Fed raises rates in 89 and 90. This, is, of course, is years after. I mean, they cut rates after to save the uh, system in 1987-88. But then they embarked on a tightening cycle, inverted the yield curve. All the bad stuff, Maggie, happened after they pressed the pause button. All the bad stuff happened in the 91-92. All the bad stuff happened in 2001-2002. Uh, in, in they stopped tightening in the mid-2000. You said in mid-2000, they stopped tightening. Uh, the tech wreck is just starting. Oh, don't worry about that so much. We're not going to go into recession. Recession started in March of 01. 
The recession started basically what, like nine months after they pressed the pause button. They paused in the summer of 06, all the bad stuff in the mortgage market and housing starts in 07. We go into recession December of 07. That, that was well over a year after they pressed the pause button. So people have to understand, and I don't want to be preachy here, that all the bad stuff, I mean, you ain't seen nothing yet. All the bad stuff is ahead of us for next year because of the lags. We have not seen the resets into this sharply higher interest rate environment. And as the Fed sees the lags take hold, by the way, it's not as if they're ignorant of that. They mentioned the lags. You had some several FOMC participants talked about the need at some point to recalibrate. That, I think, is going to start in the opening months of next year, that recalibration. Because why? Because the resets, the resets are going to accumulate. You're going to see the lag, the impact of what they've done on the equity and debt cost of capital, impair business spending plans and employment. And yes, it might well be true that companies are going to be low to lay off people because after going through two years of this acute labor shortage, I get that. Um, but even if employment stagnates and you get the participation rate going up, the unemployment rate is going to go up. It's not going to stop at 4.4% where the Fed has it. It's going to go north of 5%. That's next year's story. And interest rates are cyclical. And inflation is a lagging indicator. And so I think that uh, next year will be the story of um, a big rally in treasuries. Uh, the Fed will pivot, pause and pivot. It's just the cycle. Inflation will lag the cycle and then come down and come down hard. David, I think this is, I, I feel like I, I got to like go run to my bunker based on this, but it, we need to, I think we need to, to, to hear that point of view. And, you know, if I'm thinking about, we usually do a takeaway at the end of the interviews and tack them on, but I'm just going to do it live. So I make sure that, you know, we sort of understand because we're taking a historical look back, but I think it's really important to pull these themes into the current situation because, Right at the beginning, so much of what you talked about in 1987 seems like very familiar to what we're living through now. The end of a bull market, you know, there was a lot of leverage in the system. You had the Fed hiking rates into that's what we're dealing with right now. And if I'm hearing you when I think about this, you're you're telling us that, you know, there are some crashes that are just liquidity driven events, and there are some that are recession based that also have a liquidity element to them. That seems like where we are now. Beware the lag, beware the liquidity issues, beware leverage. The three L's are a very toxic mix right now. And the Fed is going to keep going and there is going to be collateral damage and it's going to mean a uh, higher unemployment rate. Something's probably going to fail. Inflation will eventually come down but it's going to be rough. So on your, if, if I, do I have that right? And if you put your, your kind of hat on, um, your bearish hat on, how, wh where are we on the scale? Like how bad is the fallout going to be next year? If that's what we're looking, if that's the story for 2023. Well, well it's, but it's not, you see, the thing is that it's not 1987 because 1987 uh, was not an economic recession. 1987, mm -hmm. although the Fed was draining liquidity and we had a liquidity event, uh, they didn't invert the yield curve and they didn't keep on tightening into the inverted yield curve. Uh, they weren't fighting the same sort of inflation battle that uh, Jay Powell is right now. And you could argue uh, something that he did create, um, but that's water under the bridge. So, so this in a lot worse. of ways, a lot of, in a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot worse. In 1987, um, you, you know, who's talking about ETFs? Uh, I mean, you have a lot more at stake today. Today, today, be, you see what happened is that was 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 Paul Volcker before Greenspan or Greenspan when he, when he took on the role in '86. Was he luring people into uh, into risk assets? Was it? Did you hear in 1986 in, in the lead up to '87? Did you hear FOMO? Did you hear Tina? Did you hear the Fed always has your back? Think of all the insanity that happened, and all that insanity. Look what happened. Basically, the stock market more than doubled in less than two years. And it wasn't because of corporate earnings. 80% of it was a multiple expansion because of the Fed radical easing in monetary policy. And now the movie is is unwinding, but the stakes are higher because in 1987, uh, the U.S. household sector didn't have as much uh, equity exposure uh, as it has today. I, I mean, today you're talking about uh, $75 trillion. 
of uh, of equity exposure on household balance sheets, right? Or should I say forty five trillion? It's it, it's 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 almost forty percent of the household balance sheet, and it's the same on residential real estate. We didn't have a housing bubble back in uh, nineteen eighty seven. We have a massive housing bubble right now. Uh, most of the household balance sheet is residential real estate, and it is equities. Uh, and the exposure to naked long equities in the household sector going into this year has never been this high. So what it means, and this is maybe is what Powell's trying to break, we did not have the wealth effect on spending in 1987 nearly as big. That's why people thought, oh my God, we got a 23% plunge in equity prices in one day, the day I started, 30% from the peak in late August. Um, you know, you get that today because people, because the financial economy and the real economy, Main Street and Wall Street are so intertwined. It wasn't as intertwined back in 1987. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that changed with the with the movie Wall Street, okay? But um, it 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 it's a lot different today. A lot more at stake. The other part of this, by the way, and we talked a lot about. We didn't talk about housing. The housing bubble. Now, I'm not going to say that this is going to play out like it did when I was at Merrill, okay? And the banks are better capitalized. We know all that. We know that story. But the price bubble, the price bubble is bigger when you look at classic ratios: price to income, price to rent. Price to CPI, bigger bubble this time around. Uh, we didn't have that in 1987. And we have two asset classes, long duration, interest rate sensitive. Uh, you know, back in that last cycle and say, you know, 07, 08, 09, it was housing first then equities. This time around, it was equities first. Now housing, the Case-Shiller numbers are now starting to deflate. Mm. And I would say, actually, that's going to have a bigger impact on psychology. Uh, since more Americans own a home than really uh, are long equities. The housing is actually a really big deal. Nobody talks about that. In any event, um, at some point, uh, either there'll be cracks in the financial system, there'll be a disorderly market. We're going to find out that, you know, the, these LDIs in the UK was just uh, another acronym, but there's always more than one cockroach in the kitchen. Or we're going to start to see outright job losses. The unemployment rate goes up. And uh, to me, that's really the key. You know, the, yeah, the Fed is willingly looking at lagging indicators, headline inflation, uh, unemployment. Um, but if you're concerned as a central banker that this is going to feed into wages and then we're into something totally different, which hasn't happened yet, but it's got to be their primary concern, especially after this latest CPI number, they got to get that unemployment rate up. Get the unemployment rate up. I said before, it's not like, oh, okay, so the unemployment rate goes up. No, 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 no. It's what is the ultimate impact of job loss, which we will see on household cash flows? What will that do to default rates? What will that do to home prices? Mm -hmm. And then you get a further cascading. Of course, the Fed's going to be cutting interest rates. Okay, mm -hmm. interest rates are cyclical. And I think that's going to be next year's story. Very difficult to time. Uh, I think it's going to be certainly evident in the second half of the year. And the one thing I'll say, I know you said before, you know, I mean, that you want to find a place to go hide, but it's basically, I think, empowering to know, you know, it's like my grandmother always told me when I was a kid, you know, that for, for you know, forewarned is forearmed. Okay. Like you will, you, before you leave the house, you see the clouds in the sky, you take your umbrella. What I'm saying is that this is the cycle. And you know, about cycles is this, you know, that um, the first asset class that goes into the bear market is the first asset class to exit the bear market and the first asset class to enter the bear market were treasuries. Besides that, we all know, we all know that there's no way that the stock market will ever bottom, will ever bottom until the Fed cuts rates sufficiently. By the way, the bottom in the stock market, for people that say, oh, there's no alarm bell. Yeah, there is. There actually is. 70% of the way into the Fed easing cycle and 70% of the way into the recession is when the stock market usually bottoms. After the Fed has cut rates sufficiently that it has re-steepened the yield curve to a more normal shape. You want the alarm bell, twos, tens, plus 140 basis points, not minus 50, okay? They're tightening into an inverted yield curve today, but they'll be easing and steepening the curve next year. And then uh, would... I, intend, I, I intend at that point to to become a, perma, a permable I was going to, and we'll end there based on the fact that you've, you've lived and worked through so many of these crashes. What would make you, what would change your mind and make you a little more bullish right now? Is it's there any late. outlier? It's too late. I, I guess that's what you said. It would be if, if we, 
you know, maybe maybe the decline in the market has been too orderly. Uh, maybe if we had that cataclysmic event that really shook things up, um, it'd be nice to get this over with, right? It'd be nice to get this over with. Uh, what do I need to see to turn bullish on the stock market? I need to see the, the tightening cycle end. I need to see the Fed cut rates. Remember, it's about liquidity. Liquidity, liquidity is important. And in, in the next cycle, when they cut rates, they re-steepen the yield curve, it's going to be a great indication of green shoots in the economy, a new economic cycle, uh, and um, and liquidity growth. Right now, liquidity is a huge constraint, pretty well on everything. So uh, we need to see the so so that's what we need to see. I, I don't know what precipitates it. It could well be you know that's what I mean is be careful what you wish for. Mm. Uh, you know what I wish for to turn bullish uh, takes us down to twenty seven hundred on the S and P. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that's one thing that's on my mind. the The point is, what do you do right now? Is you got to buy the asset class that was the first asset class to go into the bear market. Treasuries first in mid 2001, followed by equities, followed by commodities. But you see, there is no there is no bottom in the stock market in advance of a rally in treasuries. Treasury yields have to go down. Why do I say that? Because the equity risk premium at the stock market lows has widened 450 basis points. Right now, it's barely widened 200 basis points. The bond market needs, the treasury market needs to rally to give the stock market that relative valuation support that it always has at the lows, including in March of 09. So I say, uh, don't be scared be prepared. I like that. Another 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 thing we could put on a t-shirt. But I think you're right in being, you know, forewarned is forearmed is part of the reason we do these interviews. Well the chicken, the chicken, yeah, the chickens the chicken's gotta come before the egg. So uh I would say that um uh that and especially now that you're getting yield in the bond market, but I think that actually if I'm right on how these things play out, if I'm right on how the cycle's gonna play out um, I think that you could make easily more than 20% because, because really your, 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 your total return at the long end of the yield curve, which nobody wants to touch right now, because everybody's extrapolating the past 18 months into the future, mm. uh, big mistake. Uh, I think the total return on the long bond is likely to be more than 20% in the next year. And I had to, wow. hazard to say, Maggie, I don't think the stock market's making you 20% in the next year. Yeah. Maybe in, in it, 2020, 2024. In 2024, when I become the perma bull, but not before. <laughs> and, and and we look forward to tracking that that journey with you, David. It was so appreciate you taking the time with us today because it's really important to have that historical perspective and speak to somebody who's seen this play out before um, when we try to make sense of all the different things happening. So thank you so much. Pleasure, 100%. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.